It began in healthy looking pigs, months, perhaps years ago. A new coronavirus spread silently within herds. Gradually, farmers started getting sick. Infected people got a respiratory illness with symptoms ranging from mild flu-like signs to severe pneumonia. The sickest required intensive care, many died. At first, the spread was limited to those with close contacts, healthcare personnel, coworkers, and families. But now, it's spreading rapidly throughout local communities. International travel has turned local epidemics into a pandemic spanning the globe. Just three months ago, CAP started in South America, but has now reached several countries with more than 30,000 cases and nearly 2,000 deaths. Continuing our coverage of the newly discovered CAPS disease and the scope of its deadly outbreaks, there are now more than 30,000 reported cases. Experts warn this may be just the beginning of a global problem. GNN science reporters have produced a video about what we know so far about CAPS, the virus, the outbreak, and the resulting chaos. CAPS is a novel coronavirus related to those viruses that caused the frightening SARS epidemic in 2003 and the deadly MERS outbreaks in recent years. Scientists think each infected person in turn infects on average two more people. This disease is proving more transmissible than SARS or MERS and about as contagious as influenza. Essentially, the cumulative number of cases is doubling every week. At this rate, we can expect to see 16 times as many cases in a month unless we find a way to interrupt transmission. The virus appears to be spreading rapidly in densely populated and impoverished neighborhoods in some megacities in South America. CAPS is a serious respiratory disease. More than half of the recognized cases have required hospital care, creating a huge strain on healthcare systems. The fatality rate is about 10%. For comparison, CAPS is about as lethal as SARS and two to four times more lethal than the 1918 influenza pandemic, the worst pandemic on record. Even so, some people only exhibit mild flu-like symptoms, not requiring treatment in a hospital. Alarmingly, those people are able to walk around and spread the virus, not realizing they are doing so. Even worse, international travelers have been arriving at their destinations symptom-free, but within a matter of hours, becoming ill. Travel-related cases have blossomed into outbreaks in a number of locations and have quickly grown faster than health authorities could respond and contain them. In other places, physicians have quickly recognized the symptoms of CAPS and have been able to isolate infected individuals and avoid an outbreak for now. Global public health experts are very concerned about this disease. Because it appears the virus is readily transmitted through the air from person to person, essentially all people are susceptible. Experts agree unless it is quickly controlled, it could lead to a severe pandemic, an outbreak that circles the globe and affects people everywhere. Models developed by leading public health authorities indicate a CAPS pandemic could lead to an outcome worse than the 1918 influenza, which killed 50 to 100 million people worldwide. Given the global population is four times larger than it was in 1918, if these models prove accurate, we could be looking at hundreds of millions of deaths over the next year or two. Continuing our CAPS disease coverage and possible solutions, I'm joined by immunologist Dr. Yubani Bello and Dr. Rhea Blakey, an epidemiologist, both highly respected in their fields. Let's get right to it. Why are people saying a vaccine for the CAPS virus is not likely in the near term? Researchers are working on a vaccine and we have viable leads, but it's complicated. We have known about CAPS-like viruses in animals and people for decades, but have not been successful at developing a licensed vaccine. And sure, there are new technologies that may help, but it's going to be difficult. 
I am not optimistic about having a vaccine in time to be relevant during this pandemic. Even if we discover a good vaccine candidate, we are starting from scratch, and it takes time to test safety and efficacy, typically years. So even if testing moves quickly, global manufacturing will still need to be established. Again, multiple hurdles. We simply cannot rely on these old timelines and processes. This is a crisis. We have to move beyond these issues. It may be complicated, difficult, but if we dedicate all available resources, this can happen. Also, keep in mind, we need effective treatments sooner rather than later. Extronavir is an antiviral drug. Scientists have told me this could be effective. We need to start treating people immediately. While I agree, Extranover does look promising. It's currently used for treating HIV. However, it's not manufactured on the scale needed for treating this many people. And will we just stop using it for HIV treatment? How will we get this drug in the quantities needed? Who decides who has priority for the limited amounts we do have? We both know countries are hoarding Extranover. Doctor, in my opinion, you are lost in the details. With enough money and political will, anything is possible. Let's get going on this now. Thank you both for this extremely important discussion. Our U.S. affiliate has just released polling results on public expectations for a vaccine. A majority of Americans expect a vaccine to be available within two months, and 65% of those polled are eager to take the vaccine, even if it's experimental. In related news, a significant demand for personal protective equipment like N95 masks and gloves are on the rise due to the pandemic. However, globally, hospitals are running low. Additionally, other critical medical supplies such as saline and antibiotics are dwindling. Countries and companies are reportedly stockpiling supplies, disrupting healthcare supply chains, causing dangerous shortages in many parts of the world. In addition to global public health crisis, CAPS is creating havoc with the trade and travel industries. The frightening public health toll of CAPS continues to mount. Patients are overwhelming healthcare facilities around the world, including many of the makeshift triage and temporary care facilities. People are avoiding public spaces out of fear of infection and in compliance with public health recommendations. This has had a dramatic effect on the retail and service sectors. Businesses of all kinds are struggling to operate, let alone provide basic services as their workers have fallen sick or refused to come to work. Some companies have allowed telecommuting, but for most businesses and employees, this is not an option. Public health agencies have issued travel advisories, while some countries have banned travel from the worst affected areas. As a result, the travel sector is taking a huge hit. Travel bookings are down 45% and many flights have been canceled. A ripple effect is racing through the service sector. Governments that rely on travel and tourism as a large part of their economies are being hit particularly hard. Consumer confidence has fallen dramatically and people are delaying or canceling discretionary purchases. As a result, manufacturers are scaling back production on many goods. On the other hand, staples like food and medicine are being hoarded. Mandated border closures and trade restrictions are creating severe localized shortages. The Purchasing Managers Index suffered its sharpest decline in 50 years, a leading indicator that markets are preparing for a prolonged period of economic disruption. In some regions, politicians are adding to the noise and confusion through social media ban all goods and travel from infected countries, and boycott companies that spread disease are common Twitter refrains often led by public figures. It's safe to say we face a tough dilemma. The movement of people may facilitate the spread of gaps, but interruptions to travel and trade may have economic consequences that are just as bad. The response to the CAPS pandemic is now the most expensive international emergency ever. Political leaders around the globe are faced with many impossible dilemmas, including financial. 
We have two guests today to discuss the bottom line of catastrophic response. First up is economist Dave Gamble. Are we out of money? The best way to answer that is no, we are not out of money yet. But the fact is we are trending in a dangerous direction and something needs to change. You have been quite vocal about that and generated some controversy along the way. Well, look, you know me, I try to avoid controversy. But come on, common sense says it shouldn't be controversial to suggest our response should prioritize both lives and livelihoods. Absolutely, we need to save lives. We all know someone who's been affected by caps. But we literally cannot afford a heavy-handed response that suffocates our economy. Pragmatism is a wise choice. I mean, what exactly are the risks and benefits of slowing air travel, of staying home from work, closing schools, disrupting supply chains, interfering with our reliable channels of communication and news? Sure, some of these steps can help slow caps, but often only marginally and with serious costs. When this is all over, some families, some cities, will have suffered more from our interventions than from caps. No question, there is a lot of suffering. Let me welcome Dr. Juan Perez to this discussion. Is Dr. Gamble wrong? Actually, in a way, we agree. Responders, whether international organizations, governments, or even employers and families, each are weighing risks and benefits. And there is not a one-size-fits-all approach as there are different appetites for risk. What I will say, in my mind, our response should aim to protect every life we can. Of course it should be. But let's be frank, letting the global economy slow to a halt puts lives at risk. Yes, yes, but there does need to be a balance. Okay, you both agree balance is paramount. Theoretically, that's an easy choice. But leaders are now faced with very real and very tough decisions. Just last week, traditional sources for emergency funding had exceeded their limits. As new mechanisms are being discussed, there is consideration as whether funds should primarily support health emergency response or prop up economies. Precisely. And we do need these funds sooner rather than later. Funding shortfalls are putting lives at risk and extending this devastating crisis. Again, we seem to agree. We cannot shortchange the health response. But I suspect we disagree when I suggest that some of these funds are best used to save jobs and critical industries. National leaders certainly have this on top of their minds during the ongoing debates. Look, I am not an economist or a politician for that matter, but as a physician, I am comfortable saying that our health response to CAPS cannot afford to wait for an incredibly complex debate about what sounds to me like history's most expensive economic bailout. Thank you both, and we will be watching and listening for the outcome of these vital discussions. And certainly, the market is eagerly watching for any signs of hope. Alarming news emerging from social media companies today about the CAPS pandemic. Twitter and Facebook are reporting they've identified and deleted a disturbing number of accounts dedicated to spreading disinformation about the outbreak. For more on this, we go to our correspondent, Catalina Parks. Chen, these accounts were created by several state-sponsored groups intending to sow political discord, and some individuals are seemingly seeking to gain financial advantages. Violence against healthcare workers and minority populations has been increasing. A recent riot highlights the real danger in these posts. Countries are reacting in different ways as to how best to manage the overwhelming amounts of dis and misinformation circulating over the internet. In some cases, limited internet shutdowns are being implemented to quell panic. Thank you, Catalina. For more on this, we are joined by experts on crisis communications and social media, Kevin McAleese and Sarah Lee. To me, it is clear countries need to make strong efforts to manage both mis- and disinformation. We know social media companies are working around the clock to combat these disinformation campaigns. The task of identifying every bad actor is immense. And experts agree that new disinformation campaigns are being generated every day. This is a huge problem that's going to keep us from ending the pandemic and might even lead to the fall of governments, as we saw in the Arab Spring. If the solution means controlling and reducing access to information, 
I think it's the right choice. I agree with Kevin. This is a big problem and doesn't even account for the massive amounts of misinformation being generated by legitimate users about the pandemic. But it's not just trolls who are spreading the fake news. It's often political leaders themselves. Who's to judge what's real or not? Would we trust every government to separate truth from lies? I think this is more than just keeping the bad information out. It's also about making sure real public health information reaches the public. News is found from outlets other than social media. News organizations, public health groups and companies need to help people take the right actions to protect themselves by promoting accurate, real information about the outbreak. The outcome of the CAPS pandemic in event 201 was catastrophic. 65 million people died in the first 18 months. The outbreak was small at first and initially seemed controllable, but then it started spreading in densely crowded and impoverished neighborhoods of megacities. From that point on, the spread of the disease was explosive. Within six months, cases were occurring in nearly every country. At first, wealthy countries with advanced healthcare and public health systems were primarily able to limit the spread of the disease within their borders. As systems became overwhelmed, however, no countries were able to control its spread. And the disease affected people of all socioeconomic status, from the very poor to the extremely rich, from sanitation workers to CEOs and national leaders. The economic consequences were dramatic. The high death toll and even greater numbers of sick hurt productivity in many industries. Manufacturers were having trouble filling orders, and countless companies in the service sector simply shut down. The global economy was in a free fall, the GDP down 11 percent. Stock markets around the world plummeted between 20 and 40 percent and headed into a downward cycle of fear and low expectation. Businesses were not borrowing, banks were not lending, everyone was just hoping to hunker down and weather the storm. While nearly all businesses were affected, certain sectors were especially hard hit. Travel, finance, service, manufacturing, healthcare and insurance among them, with some major companies going bankrupt. And there were seismic societal consequences as well. The world saw large-scale protests and in some places riots. People were angry about the lack of access to health care and medicine, as well as government's inability to protect them from the disease. This led to violent crackdowns in some countries and even martial law. Political upheaval became the rule across the globe. The public lost trust in their respective administrations. Several governments fell, while others were desperately striving to hold on to power. This spurred further crackdowns. Attempts to control media messaging, originally aimed only at health-related misinformation, became used increasingly to quash political dissent. Economists say the economic turmoil caused by such a pandemic will last for years, perhaps a decade. The societal impacts, the loss of faith in government, the distrust of news, and the breakdown of social cohesion could last even longer. We have to ask, did this need to be so bad? Are there things we could have done in the five to 10 years leading up to the pandemic that would have lessened the catastrophic consequences? We believe the answer is yes. So are we as a global community now finally ready to do the hard work needed to prepare for the next pandemic?